the nightly business report. Good evening. Tonight, the Japan International Corporation Agency agrees to restart financing for the extension project of the Bandar Naik International Airport second terminal. State Minister of Finance Dr. Ranjit Singh Malapitiya anticipates that a definitive conclusion regarding the removal of the vehicle import ban will be reached by mid-August. Investors pleasantly surprised by the Colombo Stock Exchange's recovery, marking a day of gains after an extended period of decline. And Paramount and Skydance seals the deal with majority shareholder Shari Redstone agreeing to sell her ownership stake. From Studio 24, here's Anuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The Japan International Cooperation Agency has agreed to resume funding for the second terminal of the Bandaranaika International Airport Extension Project. According to Minister of Ports, Shipping and Aviation Nimal Siripala de Silva, this decision was facilitated under a concessionary loan scheme. The construction of the second terminal at BIA initially began in 2020 with financial support from the JICA. However, the project encountered a significant setback in 2022 when it was suspended due to Sri Lanka's economic crisis and subsequent default on its debt obligations. The suspension remained in place until the country's debt restructuring process was finalized. Funded by the JICA, the construction of the second terminal is a critical infrastructure project designed to enhance the capacity and functionality of the Bandaranaika International Airport, which is the main international gateway to Sri Lanka. This project, valued at 145 billion rupees, was initiated under the JICA's soft loan scheme, which offers concessional terms to support infrastructure development in emerging economies. Minister Nimal Siripala de Silva highlighted the importance of resuming this project, noting that the second terminal is essential for accommodating the increasing number of passengers and enhancing the overall efficiency of airport operations. With JICA's decision to reinstate funding, the project is expected to recommence, providing a much-needed boost to Sri Lanka's aviation infrastructure. State Minister of Finance Dr. Ranjit Siambalapitiya has stated that a final decision on lifting the ban on vehicle imports is expected to be made by second week of August. The State Minister mentioned this in Parliament today, adding that the International Monetary Fund has also been informed about the situation regarding vehicle imports. The Minister said he hoped to be able to import vehicles depending on the country's exchange rate status and the priority of people's needs. Public transport vehicles, good transport vehicles and private vehicles will be imported under the regulations. He added that although the cabinet had approved the import of 1,000 vehicles, specifically 250 buses and 750 vans to be used in tourism sector, none have been imported so far. The OPEC fund has agreed to provide 100 million US dollars for the Mahavali Water Security Investment Program. This agreement was reached during a discussion between State Minister of Finance Shehan Masinga and Yusuf Al Mulhalm, the Asia Pacific Regional Manager, the OPEC Fund for International Development. Mahavali Water Security Investment Program is set to be implemented with over $300 million in aid from the Asian Development Bank. Additionally, the OPEC Fund has agreed to contribute more than $100 million to this project. During the meeting, the minister expressed his gratitude to the OPEC Fund for their support on behalf of the people of Sri Lanka. Under the Mahavali Water Security Investment Program, the project will feed from the Moragahakanda and Kalungaga Reservoirs to Hurulwewa and Mahakanda Reservoir. Minister Shehan Seymour Singh discussed this matter during his recent visit to Austria and further discussions were held yesterday at the Minister of Finance. The minister stated that the allocation of funds by the OPEC Fund for this long-term project aimed at benefiting the country's agricultural sector was influenced by the success of debt restructuring and ongoing reform programs in Sri Lanka. He further noted that international confidence in Sri Lanka has contributed to this outcome. The OPEC Fund has previously contributed to 13 completed projects and is currently supporting seven ongoing projects. Due to a trade union action initiated by customs officers based on several demands, between 3,000 to 4,000 containers are currently stuck at the port. Container Transport Associations have stated that there is a risk of container transport charges increasing by about 10% in this situation. 
Several customs trade unions are currently engaged in a work-to-rule union action, accusing the government of attempting to unilaterally amend the customs ordinance and alleging efforts to amalgamate the Sri Lanka customs, the Department of Inland Revenue and the Excise Department into a single entity, with plans to delegate their powers to a private organization. These trade unions have been protesting through symbolic work stoppages on the 5th and 6th of this month. However, given the current situation, container transport associations are highlighting that a large number of containers are stuck at the port, unable to be cleared. This significant backlog is directly attributed to the ongoing union action, which has severely impacted the efficiency of customs operations and container clearance processes. The unions argue that the proposed changes threaten the integrity and independence of customs operations, potentially compromising revenue collection and enforcement capabilities. They insist that these reforms are being pushed forward without proper consultation with the relevant stakeholders, raising concerns about transparency and accountability. The Public Utilities Commission of Sri Lanka says that the final decision regarding the electricity tariff revision will be announced on the 15th of July after reviewing the public opinions. PUCSL Chairman Professor Manjal Fernando stated that views were obtained from 46 per registered delegates representing various sectors. The Ceylon Electricity Board has handed over its proposals pertaining to the revision of electricity tariffs to the Public Utilities Commission of Sri Lanka. According to the proposals, the overall reduction of tariffs as a percentage is 13.8%. Accordingly, there will be a 25.5% decrease in rates for the domestic category and a 3% reduction for religious and charitable institutions. However, the proposals do not include any tariff reductions for hotel and industrial sectors. The Tea Research Institute of Sri Lanka predicts that Sri Lanka's tea exports are expected to generate a revenue of 1.5 billion US dollars in the year 2024. Meanwhile, as part of the first stage of a three-phase program to provide fertilizer at a consistent rate, 10,000 metric tons out of the planned 30,000 metric tons of fertilizer have been distributed among tea planters so far. Recently, Minister of Agriculture and Plantation Industries Mahinda Amaravira convened a progress review meeting of the Senkums Estate in Talavakale and the Tea Research Institute of Sri Lanka. Addressing the progress review meeting, Minister of Agriculture and Plantation Industries Mahinda Amaravira revealed that the already cultivated lands of tea estates are sufficient for the development of Sri Lanka's tea plantation industry. It was discussed during the meeting that the ban imposed on the import of agrochemicals in 2021 in promotion of organic agriculture affected the tea plantations, resulting in less amounts of fertilizer used on tea plantations in 2022 and 2023. This resulted in a decrease in tea production, according to the minister. However, the current government, through the two state fertilizer providers, is taking measures to provide fertilizers at a concessionary price. Additionally, the minister stated that as such, 50 kilograms of three types of tea fertilizers with a market value of 14,000 rupees are provided at prices ranging from 5,500 rupees to 7,500 rupees. Let's go for a short break. Some unexpected developments coming right after this from the Colombo Stock Exchange. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. The Colombo Stock Exchange pleasantly surprises investors with a day of gains following a prolonged downturn. Both indices show positive movement, marking a significant recovery from recent declines. To get the insights of today's market performers, let's join with Gamidu Pathiragay from Capital Alliance Securities. Today, the Kalam Stock Exchange concluded on a positive note compared to the previous trading session brought on by a slightly improved sentiment among the market participants. The market ended at 11,081.5 points, marking a 26-point increase from the previous session with a turnover of 800 million rupees. The SL20 index also experienced an upward movement of 14.47 points to end the day at 3,452 points. Notable institutional engagement was observed across various sectors, with crossings on Agalavath Plantation and Sampath Bank PLC. The top five gainers for the day were SMB Leasing, Tesla Group PLC, Renuka Holdings PLC, 
Brown's Investments and LOSC Finance. The top 5 losers for the day were Blue Diamond Jewelry Non-Voting, Tessa Group Non-Voting, The New Aurelia Hotels Company, Citizen Development Bank and Venuka Holdings PLC. The central bank's bill auction for this week commenced today, yielding noteworthy results. For detailed analysis and outcomes from today's proceedings, we now turn to Zaima Jehan joining us from First Capital Holdings. At the weekly T-bill auction today, uh, we saw weighted average yield rates declining across the board after five weeks. Also, central bank fully accepted the total offered amount of uh, 105 billion rupees. Uh, with full subscription on the offered amount of all three bills. Uh, there was an overall decline of about 9 basis points to uh, 16 basis points in the weighted average yield rates, uh, with the biggest decline observed on the three-month bill. Uh, following the provisional deal with ISB holders that was concluded last week, secondary markets saw a slight pickup in activities, but uh, however, investor sentiment was rather mixed. Yet again, uh, as the week progressed, activities uh, turned dull as uh, investors took the sidelines awaiting the outcome of uh, today's uh, bill auction and the bond auction scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, so at tomorrow's T-bond auction, 138 billion rupees uh, is expected to be raised with uh, 58 billion rupees raised from the 2027 maturity while uh, 80 billion rupees is uh, expected to be raised from the 2031 maturity. Outcome of uh, tomorrow's auction uh, remains crucial in determining the interest rate outlook for the period ahead. Uh, so with the decline in weighted average yield rates at today's auction and a slight possible downswing of rates at tomorrow's auction will gradually and slowly lead to a further reduction in overall interest rates. Gold prices rose slightly in Asia today as comments from Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell sparked increased speculation over when the central bank will begin cutting interest rates. Sport Gold rose 0.2% to $2,367.73 an ounce, while gold futures expiring in August rose 0.3% to $2,373.90 an ounce. Gold saw some strength in recent sessions as the gold prices for the dollar dropped amid increased expectations for a September rate cut. Among industrial metals, copper prices sank, wiping out a bulk of a recent recovery following mixed inflation signals from top copper importer China. Oil prices edged higher today as industry data showed a larger than anticipated draw in US crude inventories. However, a build in distillate stockpiles somewhat tempered the optimism over tighter markets. Brent crude futures rose 0.2% to $84.84 per barrel, while West Texas immediate crude futures gained 0.3% to $80.76 per barrel. Crude prices had been nursing some losses earlier this week as chatter over a potential ceasefire between Israel and Hamas led traders to price out some of the risk premium from oil. The Sri Lankan rupee is on an upward trend as it further appreciates against the US dollar today. Accordingly, the buying rate of the US dollar has dropped from 299.79 rupees to 299.26 rupees, while the selling rate has also reduced from 309.12 rupees to 308.50 rupees. The rupee has also appreciated against a basket of foreign currencies and let's take a look at it now as the rates of Sri Lankan rupees. A short commercial break now. News from the corporate world coming on the other side.
Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Qatar Airways has officially increased its daily flights between Sri Lanka and Doha, transitioning from a five daily flight schedule to six daily flights, effective from today. The first of these additional flights landed in Colombo today, marking the commencement of this expanded service. This strategic increase in flight frequency underscores Qatar Airways' commitment to offering more choices and enhanced connectivity for passengers travelling to and from Sri Lanka. The airline's dedication to providing superior service is further evidenced by its use of the Boeing 787 aircraft for these additional flights. This state-of-the-art aircraft features 30 business class seats and 281 economy class seats, ensuring a comfortable and premium travel experience for all passengers. With the introduction of the sixth daily flight, Qatar Airways now operates a total of 42 weekly flights between Sri Lanka and Doha. This network enhancement connects passengers to nearly 170 global destinations, providing seamless travel options through Qatar Airways' home hub, Hamad International Airport. The newly added flights offer passengers more options to connect to major destinations in the Middle East, Europe, Africa and beyond. This expansion is expected to facilitate greater travel flexibility and convenience, enhancing the overall travel experience for Qatar Airways passengers. Sri Lanka's only specialized integrated cable manufacturer and subsidiary of ACL Group, Cable Solutions Limited, announced its plans for its initial public offering and subsequent listing on the DRI Savvy Board of the Colombo Stock Exchange. The IPO aimed to offer a total of 80,786,600 ordinary voting shares to the public. This comprised two main components, a subscription offer of 14,666,600 new ordinary voting shares and an offer for sale of 66,120,000 existing ordinary voting shares by minority shareholders, contingent upon full subscription of the new shares. Leading up to the IPO, Cable Solutions Limited had announced its intentions to raise significant capital through the sale of shares. The offer price was set at seven rupees and fifty cents per share, with the company targeting a total fundraising of one hundred and nine million nine hundred and ninety nine thousand five hundred rupees from the subscription offer alone. The primary objective was to allocate eighty one point eight percent of the proceeds towards capital expenditures for new machinery and production line upgrades aimed at enhancing overall production efficiency. The remaining 18.2% of the funds were earmarked to bolster the company's working capital position, ensuring operational stability and growth. Several existing shareholders, including Rosewood Private Limited, Associated Electrical Corporation Limited, and Pereira & Sons Bakers Private Limited, participated in the offer for sale of 66,120,000 ordinary voting shares. Ceylon Curry Club, a member of the Citrus Group and Sri Lanka's premier restaurant for contemporary Sri Lankan and fusion cuisine, was honoured to be invited for a second time to India's biggest pre-wedding celebration ahead of the nuptials of Anand Ambani and Radhika Machant. The restaurant's exotic culinary creations were featured at the main Sangeet ceremony dinner. Amongst the dishes on offer were its famed Sri Lankan hoppers, street food favourites like lamb kothu and a live string hopper station, along with signature dishes such as crab cobbler, fish and bultial and Ceylon style hot butter calamari. The team that participated at this grand event, which was held in Mumbai recently, comprised 13 culinary stars from Ceylon Curry Club and from across the Citrus Group. It was an exceptional opportunity to showcase their culinary skills and Sri Lanka's gastronomic heritage. This engagement reflects the restaurant's growing local and international reputation for quality and service since opening its doors in 2021. The Royal Institute International School in Colombo successfully hosted the second Royal Institute Model United Nations Conference 2024 recently. The event took place in the school's auditorium located in Kohuala. The conference saw active participation from over 300 student delegates representing 17 schools from across the country. These young delegates engaged in rigorous debates representing various countries on behalf of their schools. The two-day conference provided a dynamic platform for the delegates to engage in debates and discussions, simulating real United Nations proceedings. Each delegate took on the role of representing a specific country 
debating on international issues and policies. At the conclusion of the conference, the delegates who excelled in various categories of the debate competitions were awarded certificates in recognition of their skills and efforts. This served as an encouragement for their hard work and dedication throughout the event. The event ended on a high note with vibrant cultural performances, including dance and music, adding a touch of festivity and celebration to the occasion. These performances not only showcased the diverse talents of the students, but also highlighted the spirit of unity and collaboration that the conference aimed to foster. The event highlighted the importance of youth engagement in global issues and encouraged the development of critical thinking, public speaking and leadership skills among the participants. Let's take a short commercial break. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Shares were mixed today in Asia after remarks by Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell in front of Congress did little to change investors' expectations for the timing of a Fed interest rate cut. Tokyo's Nikkei 225 index touched a fresh intraday trading high but fell back, hitting 0.1% lower to 41,536 10 by midday. In Hong Kong, the Hang Seng Index gained 0.4% to 17,587.16, while the Shanghai Composite Index gave up 0.3% to 2,949.60. Australia's S&P ASX 200 was 0.3% lower at 7,806.30. In Seoul, the Kospi fell 0.2% to 2,862.89. Nasdaq and S&P 500 notch record highs as optimism about the growth of AI across the U.S. corporate landscape offset uncertainty around the Fed's rate cut path. The S&P 500 and Nasdaq continued their streaks of record high closes on Tuesday, fueled by gains in NVIDIA, and after U.S. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell told lawmakers that more good economic data would strengthen the case for rate cuts. The Dow dipped more than a tenth of a percent, the S&P 500 edged up for its fifth straight record close, and the Nasdaq pushed higher for its sixth straight. In testimony before Congress, Powell said that while inflation remains above the 2 percent soft landing target, it has been improving in recent months and more good data would strengthen the case for interest rate cuts. Those bets were at under 50 percent a month ago. Inflation data is also due this week, including Thursday's Consumer Price Index and the Producer Price Index reading on Friday. AI chipmaker NVIDIA again powered the gains, climbing 2.5% and offsetting declines in other chip stocks. Microsoft dipped 1.4%, while Tesla added 3.7%, bringing its gain in 2024 to 5%. Shares of J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo climbed over 1%, and Citi rose 2.8%. The three banks will release quarterly results on Friday, marking the start of second quarter earnings season. Paramount and Skydance announced their plans to merge on Monday, and today they have officially reached an agreement for the merger. Paramount's majority shareholder, Shari Redstone, has agreed to sell her ownership stake to Skydance, led by David Ellison, for a sum totaling $8 billion US dollars. One of Hollywood's most iconic companies, Paramount Global, has agreed to merge with independent film studio Skydance Media. Paramount's controlling shareholder, Shari Redstone, agreed to sell her stake to David Allison's Skydance for $8 billion. US dollars. Under the agreement, Skydance will invest back some $8 billion in merging their TV and movie production studio with Paramount, while additionally acquiring the Redstone family's national amusements, which holds 77% of Paramount's voting shares, for $2.4 billion. While Paramount's shares have fallen by more than 75% in the last five years, the studio created many hit films, such as the Godfather series, Breakfast at Tiffany's, Star Trek and the Mission Impossible franchise. 
Thank you for joining us on tonight's Nightly Business Report. We look forward to having you with us again tomorrow. I'm Sunny Mudanayaka wishing you a peaceful night ahead. Good night.